Tesla was obviously a, a prolific inventor. He was uh, an engineer and his contributions to the development of electrical engineering were monumental. Uh, we all kind of know that. His patents and his contributions to science covered a huge range of technologies, including alternating current AC, electrical systems, and the AC motor, which is very famous, more famous than people realize, I believe. And then you have wireless communication, and there's so much more. So, Mark, you're, you're the leading researcher on Tesla the man. And that led to the attention of the History Channel and the creation of the Tesla Files, which I have thoroughly absorbed. And then you also have two books about Nikola Tesla. There's uh, Wizard, The Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. And then there's Tesla, The Wizard at War, and about the genius and the particle beam weapon and the pursuit of power, which is half of my questions that we're going to be talking about today. So... Where did your obsession with Tesla begin? How did how did all that happen? Let's talk about you for a, for a little bit. Well, I was teaching parapsychology. Uh, this was back in the 1970s. I was trying to figure out the neurophysiology of telepathy. And I came across a book by a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist monk. His name was Lapsang Rampa. And it's called the third eye. His third eye was there's an operation when he was about 12 years old where they open up his third eye and he becomes even more psychic. And he becomes a psychic for the Dalai Lama. He can see uh, the aura around uh, people and he can see whether it's a bad person or is a good person. It was just mm -hmm. an incredibly great book. So I then got the next book. It was called Doctor from Lhasa. And you learn about how he got his medical degree in China. And then in the third book, The Rampa Story, you find out that the guy who's writing all these books is, is, is not Lapsang Rampa. His name was Cyril Hoskins. He was a British plumber and that he wanted to die. Um, and so this was during uh, World War II, right after World War II. And Rampa wanted to live. So they go up to the astral plane and they swap souls. And so yeah. Rampa takes over uh, uh Cyril Hoskins body and it is, it is that Rampa who's writing all these books he's written about a dozen books they are great books and it's an unbelievable story it's very hard to believe and I'm writing articles for ESP magazine and ancient astronauts magazine and so I go down to New York to do more research on Lapsang Rampa and I find a book on avatars Jesus Christ was one of them Lapsang Rampa was another one and then there was a one about a guy I never heard of his name was Nikola Tesla. He was supposedly born on the planet Venus, landed on the Earth in 1856, and was raised by Earth parents uh, in the mountains of Croatia. And he came to the world to, to give us the alternating current electrical power system. Now, if you go back to the 1870s, the 1880s, everyone was using something called direct current. And direct current was very weak. You could only send electricity about a mile power dropping off over distance. So if you wanted to electrify uh, New York City, you needed more than a half a dozen power stations and every one of them was coal operated. So you, and it was just for lighting, you couldn't run factories. So you can imagine all the smoke, there were 3000, uh, when Tesla came into all this story, there were 3000 uh, coal operated local power plants at every little hamlet across the Northeast uh, in the 1880s and eight, in the 1890s. And so part of the story, the myth about Tesla was that he landed on the earth to protect the earth and save the earth from all this air pollution because his uh, AC power system runs on waterfalls. He, from one waterfall, Niagara Falls, you could do away with all 3000 power stations and, and it's, it's, uh, it's pollution free. It really is the utopian dream when you really think about it. I mean, our cars produce a tremendous amount of pollution, and we still have a lot of pollution from other reasons, but we're not producing any pollution from hydroelectric power system. So that was the myth about him. And I thought, this is this is a ridiculous story. I mean, if a guy had invented the AC power uh, polyphase system, also wireless communication, remote control, fluorescent and neon lights, uh, computers, um, robotics, I would have heard of him. But I'm in the New York Public Library. So I go into the library and I find an article on high frequency phenomena that this guy Nikola Tesla wrote in the 1890s. And I'm going, wow, he really was a real person. 
So I then got a book of his patents. It's this thick. It's a thousand pages book of his patents, lectures and articles. And I'm going, I'm sitting on the biggest story in the world here because he's real and he's got patents. If I can prove that he really is the inventor of the hydroelectric power system or fluorescent lights or wireless communication, I'm sitting on a huge story. So he he became the subject of my doctoral dissertation as to why this incredibly famous man's name disappeared. And that uh, doctoral dissertation, uh, which uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner, he's 90 years old now, uh, was my mentor, was over 700 pages. And that resulted in, in Wizard, the, the Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. So that's really how it started. I, I, I was on a, a quest to learn more about this crazy guy, uh, Lapsang Romper, and I learned an, about someone else. Um, and that's what got me started on Tesla. Wow. wow. That's pretty wild. And I mean, I mean, I, I didn't hear about the, I have the, the Venus aspect of it. I haven't heard that before. Um, has, because I mean, one of the questions that I, um, was holding kind of holding back for later on, but we'll go ahead and get into that now is because he was so ahead of his time. He was absolutely so brilliant that a lot of people simply couldn't relate to him on a, on relatively a social and, and somewhat of a professional level. Um, do you believe, or has it, you know, been uh, documented in any way that, that he actually did some sort of a channeling to where he got his ideas well, you bring up a really interesting question. In 1976, which was the year I got interested in Tesla, the movie The Man Who Fell to Earth came out, and it starred David Bowie as an extraterrestrial right. who mm -hmm. gives the world all of these inventions. It really mm -hmm. was a, a, a takeoff of, of the mythology about Tesla. It was a book called The Return of the Dove, which was basically the source for this just the story that I just told. Uh, mm -hmm. The lady who wrote Return of the Dove wrote this book about avatars. Uh, Edis, uh, Einstein would be one. Uh, um, uh, Jesus would be one. And uh, Lapsang Rampa would be another. And Tesla would be another. And she was the one who started the myth that he was born uh, from another planet. Okay. Tesla is a, is a contradiction. We are all contradiction. But Tesla is very contradictory because he didn't believe in telepathy. He is the inventor of wireless communication. I've had a, a number of telepathic experiences. I've done telepathy experiments. I work with super psychics who were telepathic, like Uri Geller and Matthew Manning and Ingo Swan, who did the remote viewing for the finding Russian installations for the CIA. So mm -hmm. I know that we have, uh, you know, one brain can communicate with it, with another brain. Tesla didn't believe in that. So Tesla, he had so much inspiration but he he disclaims any uh, you know idea that he's gotten his ideas from a higher source. But uh, he had underneath it all a belief in God, and I think you know, there's a word. It's called teleology. T e l e o l o g y. Teleology that there is purpose to the universe that we're headed someplace. Um, when you if you look at an acorn. It's built on the tele teleological principle. If you plant that acorn, 30 years later, you got a 50-foot oak tree. So if we're headed someplace, so he understood that nature uh, would, would create electricity in a much more natural fashion than what was current, occurring at the time. What the, This gets back to how what electricity really is. Electricity by its nature is alternating. It's going back and forth and back and forth at thousands of times a second. So think of a river that's going downstream, then upstream, then downstream, then upstream at thousands of times a second. How can you make the water wheel go in one direction? So what they did was they eliminated the upflow. That's what direct current is. And they used something called a commutator. What a commutator was, was a series of wire br brushes with a little gap between them. So when the energy was coming in one direction, it would jump the gap and go in the other direction. And when it reversed, it would go back, you know, to its source. So what, what direct current was, was any energy that could jump that little gap made it to the other side. That's what DC was, but it was very inefficient. As I said, you could only send electricity about one mile, power dropping off over distance, and you could never run a factory. I live in the Northeast 
and uh, there were still these factories all along rivers. You had to put a factory right on the river. You had to be so close to the power source. If you were, you know, 50, uh, 10 blocks away, you couldn't run your factory. You had to be right. on the river. That's the, that's the world that we're in. So Tesla had an understanding, and here's to answer your question, maybe mystical, I, it came from Goethe, you know, the belief that Mother Nature is smarter than we are. And so he felt that Mother Nature must have a solution that wouldn't have this uh, sparking uh, commutator that would make electricity so inefficient. So when his professor, Professor Poschel, said, um, you know, I'm showing you my DC machine and, and Tesla saw all the sparking, he had an inspiration and he said to the professor, I think we can do away with that commutator and harness AC on its own. And... Uh, Professor Poschel said, uh, you know, Mr. Tesla, you may be very smart, but it's changing its direction of flow at thousands of times a second. That's a perpetual motion scheme. It's impossible. Everybody thought it was impossible. And so he spent the next five years of daily research trying to figure it out. And that's when he had the revelation, he was in Budapest, of coming up with the idea of using two circuits out of phase with each other, timing the two circuits in such a way that you create rotation. It, it's in my book. I think it's on page 23 or something. But if you spend five minutes or 10 minutes looking at that design, you will see how he did away with the commutator. So the difference between DC, which Edison was using when he tried to talk Edison into his machine, and AC, which is what Westinghouse purchased, with DC, you could only send energy a mile, power dropping off of a distance only for lighting homes. With AC, you could send electricity hundreds of miles and you could run power stations, you could run factories. So you could place a factory in the middle of a forest as long as you've got a power line. So it's the difference between a horse and buggy and landing a rocket ship on the moon. That's the difference. And Tesla spoke as the inventor uh, uh, at Niagara Falls in 1897 to a huge applause. And when I got into this in the 1970s, there were still a lot of articles not saying Tesla was the inventor. They were trying to hide that. And part of the reason was uh, people like Charles Steinmetz, who was invested in General Electric. They were competing electrical you know, uh, companies. So when Westinghouse was trying to win the, the War of the Currents, he had to fight uh, General Electric. He had to fight Edison. And he had to fight a number of Thomas uh, Houston, uh, L. U. Thompson. And they all denigrated him, uh, put him down, mm -hmm. and they buried his name. Uh, his name was taken out of the history books. And my book, what I did was I cited every single source. There's a thousand uh, references in there. So when uh, the uh, Scientific American um, reviewed the book, it was written by the guy who wrote his doctoral dissertation on Charles Steinmetz. He was not mm -hmm. a very nice guy to me. Uh, so he was pretty critical of the book, but somewhere buried in his re in the review of my book in Scientific American, he said it was a serious piece of scholarship. He tried like mm. heck to, dis to, to discover there must be something wrong with my research, but there was nothing wrong with it. Tesla really is the inventor of the hydroelectric power system. And that's the mystical thing that had he not come in at that time, we would be stuck with this inferior system. Uh, and uh, and we and the skies would be much polluted, more, more polluted. So I think that Tesla is the single most important person uh, responsible for helping to slow down global warming. Because had he not come in when he did, we would the skies would have been so much more blackened. With, with there were three thousand power stations, you know, in the eighteen eighties. But as you wow. get more hamlets, et cetera, you would have more and more coal powered uh, stations. Right. Yeah. Wow. Now, I've, I've heard all kinds of so wild stories about Tesla from, you know, experiments with electricity to interactions with pigeons. What's the craziest thing you've uncovered about him in your research? He loved pigeons and uh, <laughs> they make fun of him that he was in love with a white pigeon. And in fact, he tells uh, John <laughs> O'Neill, who wrote the first uh, great biography on Tesla called Prodigal Genius, uh, that I loved uh, this pigeon like a man loves a, a woman. Now, people make fun of that, but we all have had pets that we love. Totally. And I think, I when I would lecture, I taught for 40 years, I, I would talk about dogs. I'd say there are two types of dogs. Some dogs are just stupid dogs, and other dogs are secretly <laughs> human. 
How many of you know a secretly human dog? Everyone raises a hand because they know the secretly human dogs and they know the stupid dogs. So most pigeons are stupid pigeons, but some pigeons are secretly human. And I think this white pigeon was one of those secretly human pigeons. He was on that level with him. So I think that like we all love our, 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 our pets, he was in love with this pigeon. And uh, he, he was in a, you know, aesthetic. He, he did not uh, mate with, with, with a woman and he claimed he never even touched a woman. Um, and I don't, I think he really did not have sex. I think he really devoted his time totally to science and had to, uh, you know, give up that part of his life. So in, in, uh, in this series, the Tesla files on the history channel, there was when he was at the New Yorker and that's kind of when the, the whole pigeon story saga began and I've heard the the uh, the story that you know where he said he loved this pigeon, but in in the in the in the series, you kind of it was kind of indicated that possibly that he was using the pigeons or the homing pigeons as a way of communicating because he felt he was being watched. And would the uh, would the idea of saying you know I'm have this fatuation or I'm in love with this pigeon be more of a of a deflection? So that, you know, instead of them thinking, well, what's he doing with those pigeons is that he just had this obsession with them, um, you know, so that he could continue to spend his time with the pigeons and nobody would think anything of it. Well, when we, we set up the Tesla files, I had to do a lot of research to come up with a lot of new information. And what I looked at was the, the Trump report at that. I know Donald Trump because I grew up in New York. Uh, I don't didn't physically know him, but I, you know, I knew everyone knew Donald Trump. And I knew that when I, I had that. the Trump report since the early 1990s or the late 19, early 1990s. And it was written by John G. Trump, who worked at MIT, he was a physicist. And um, it, I knew the names were the same, but there was no way that he was related to Donald Trump. I mean, I just assumed they're just two people had the same last name. When we were making the television show, that's when I discovered that, that he was actually oh, really? Donald Trump's uncle. Mm -hmm. um, now, he was hired, he was working for uh, military intelligence. And the guy who was in charge of military intelligence was Van Eva Bush. Van Eva Bush was the dean of MIT. Mm -hmm. Van Eva Bush was also in charge of uh, the Manhattan Project. He appears in the movie Oppenheimer. Matthew Modine uh, pl plays his part. We're working on a Tesla film right now. And we, I don't, I'd like Matthew Modine to come back because... Uh, you know, being yeah, yes. important for a little story. Uh, but for everybody, for everybody watching Oppenheimer, top notch. Yes, it a great movie. it's a great movie. It was a great uh, movie. And so, Van Eva Bush, um, I have a book of all the letters that were that wished Tesla a happy birthday. And one of the people that wished him a happy birthday when he turned 75 was Albert Einstein. There were five Nobel Prize winners that wished him happy birthday. Two or three of them worked on the Manhattan Project. One of them was the dean from uh, MIT, and the Serbs had the had the the uh, letter in this giant book that they put together, but they couldn't read the signature. Bush has a horrible signature, and I read it. So in 1931, Van Eva Bush wrote uh, Tesla as dean of the MIT, wishing him happy birthday. Van Eva Bush then goes on to become the head of the Manhattan Project, the head of all secret weapons development for the United right. States government. And Van Eva Bush hires John G. Trump, who was, who was one of his professors at MIT, to look at Tesla's papers after he died. Um, Van Eva Bush was working with pigeons. Um, and what, what he was doing was, if you sent a, a rocket you know, with a bomb in it, how, how do you make sure that it'll stay on target and hit what you know, the, the building that you want it to hit so you can adjust as it's going down so they were training pigeons to put them inside these rockets and as the as the rockets would go down the pigeon would go correct and the pigeon would die in the process mm. so so there's a military use of uh yeah. pigeons and tesla was very active in, in uh, working and healing pigeons so we speculated that possibly Tesla was helping with the military, not in that particular experiment, but with homing pigeons, uh, because they were using homing pigeons all the time. 
And so it's very possible that he was involved with the use of homing pigeons. Also, what's interesting about the Hotel New Yorker, it was off the grid. It had its own power station. Well, that's um, a fascinating I, story. I was, you know, alive when we had the, the great blackout in New York, when, when the whole Northeast went out. Well, the whole Northeast went out except for the Hotel New Yorker because it had its own power station. So in the 1940s, it was off the grid at that time, too. We were speculating that's very possible that the military would have important people living in the Hotel New Yorker because of World War II. And Tessa might very well have been interacting with them. And that was the link between the pigeons and the military that, that we came up with. Okay. So... Um... I think I want to save the New Yorker till uh, a little bit later on in our conversation because uh, it's <laughs> it blew my mind. I had never heard that aspect of it. So, uh, yeah, we'll get into that. So, um, but going back to the way that um, Tesla was treated while he was alive, as far as his inventions and such, that you know, we, we hear the biggest uh, uh, comp competition was with Edison the AC, the DC. Um, but there was a lot of other scientists or inventors uh, in that in that regard too. Was, in my comparison with Edison and, and Tesla, was Edison just simply a better marketer than Tesla? I mean, Tesla seemed more reserved and kind of, you know, kind of uh, uh, a little quieter. Yeah. Edison was very, you know, he couldn't work. He couldn't wait to work for Tom Edison. Edison had invented a machine that could talk, a machine that could reproduce the sounds of birds, speak right. in different languages, a phonograph. Right. Um, and he also invented, he didn't invent the light bulb, but he invented the best light bulb. So he couldn't work. He couldn't wait to work for Edison. Mm -hmm. And he tried to talk Edison into his AC motor. And Edison was saying, how can you make an electricity that's going two different directions, go in one direction? Don't don't tell me about it. I'm dealing with Westinghouse right. and Elihu Thompson, and they're they're ripping me off, and they're using AC. So I don't want to hear about it. And that's this the, the source of the battle that happened between them. Um, so Edison was highly successful. However, Edison ran into a lot of trouble because eventually DC was was defunct, and J.P. Morgan, who owned Edison Electric, who was backing it, told Edison we're three million dollars in debt because of all the lawsuits that we've had to fight and because of all the ripoffs that are, that are going on, I have to form a partnership with our competitor. I'll try to, I don't think I can get in with Westinghouse, but I think I can get in with, with uh, L.U. Thompson. So we're going to take your name off the electrical company. And instead of it being called Edison Electric, it's now going to be called General Electric. And Edison was so angry that he left uh, electricity and he never dealt in that field again he moved into oh, wow. motion pictures uh so he was very angry at, at jp morgan um but he's his signature is very famous i happen to be a graphologist he's got a beautiful signature and it became like uh, like walt disney's signature a trademark and also it was on every single phonograph everybody had a phonograph and everybody had light bulbs so he stayed very famous tesla would have stayed famous if he had succeeded in wireless and the problem that he had was he put all of his eggs in one basket. He built Wardenclyffe, which was this huge tower out on Long Island. And Marconi, who was using inferior electrical equipment, with Marconi's system, this is 1899 and the early 1900s, you could only send dots and dashes. Marconi was using a Hertzian spark gap machine. So you could do, 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 do. you could send dots and dashes, but you couldn't send voice. Tesla had continuous wave frequencies. So what we call Hertzian waves are actually Tesla waves. Tesla is the inventor of the wireless system that we now use. It took Marconi about 20 years to, to adapt more and more of Tesla's system. But by the time uh, he was the first, Marconi was the first to send electricity across the Atlantic Ocean, he became hugely famous and people therefore assumed he must have the best system because he beat Tesla. And right. Morgan was backing Tesla, and Morgan saw Marconi was succeeding with on, with twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment. And I've already invested with you one hundred fifty thousand. You want even more money now? Uh, and Tesla said, "You have to trust me." And 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 uh, and Morgan didn't want to do that. And at the same time, Marconi now had electrical uh, powers and uh, electrical wireless stations 
literally all over the world. So he had, you know, 50 or 100 more power, uh, uh, wireless stations, you know, in South America, in, in Australia, in China. I mean, he was all over the world. And Tesla had this one giant tower and said, I'm going to either do this one tower or I'm going to die. And, that, <laughs> and I think that that was basically Tesla's uh, falling. He should yeah. have, I'm a football guy, he should have dropped back and punted. Yeah. Um, so, he, and yeah. So Marconi, though, but his 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 invention was also based on other patents of Tesla's, correct? Yes, totally. And Tesla, for a while, said, "Let him keep going. He's got seventeen of my patents," and 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 he sued Marconi. What Marconi did this is a really interesting story. Uh, it's all in both of the books. Uh, but in 1915, Marconi sued the U.S. Navy, and what I discovered. Franklin Roosevelt was the assistant secretary of the Navy. I, I have a letter signed by Franklin Roosevelt. The whole letter is written in, in Wizard, where Roosevelt says, uh, we're being sued by Marconi. But you know what I found? I found uh, all the patents and letters uh, from Tesla who predates Marconi. So we're going to use uh, Tesla's patents to combat Marconi in the legal suit that Marconi has when he's suing the U.S. Navy. Uh, so... Uh, Franklin Roosevelt very well knew who Tesla was. What happened, though, we were then sucked into the war. 1915, we were still neutral. By 1917, we were then fighting a World War I, and it never got resolved in Tesla's favor. And basically, had the war not happened, I think Tesla would have been able to beat Marconi uh, in the legal arena. He beat him in France, and he was in the process of beating him in the United States, and then the war came in, and they suspended all litigation. And by and by the end of the war, Marconi's system was so far all over the world. And by then, he had adapted a lot of Tesla's technology that they basically just screwed Tesla, moved over to Marconi. Uh, uh, Sarnoff took over Marconi's system and created a NBC uh, a television station. And Tesla was on mm -hmm. the outs, and that and so he he got screwed. And uh, and that World War One played a huge role in, in having that happen. Wow. <laughs> uh, he definitely needed a PR firm working for him or somebody <laughs> at, you know, uh, kind of protecting him. So, um, because like I said, it, it seemed like he was, I mean, he was being erased from history while he was alive. I thought most of that was happening after, after he passed away. Um, but then you guys went to the Tesla Museum in Serbia. Was that in his hometown or just his home country? It's in Serbia. Uh, he grew up in Croatia in a, in a different country. Oh, okay. Near, near the Adriatic Sea and Serbia is much more inland, much more towards Russia. And, uh, how did that the, the museum end up in Serbia, not in Croatia then? Because Tesla was a Serb. Um, it's like the Jews are attached to Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, you could be a, a Jewish person in, in Afghanistan. You're still attached to Israel. Right. In spiritual okay. way. Serbs mm -hmm. were all attached to Serbia, no matter where they lived. So even though he grew up in, in Croatia, his heart was really in Serbia. So that's why they put the museum in Serbia. Okay. So and when you guys went to the uh, to the museum, I mean, that had to have been something else. Had you had ever been there before? Yeah, I did a lot of my research there. I had been uh, good friends with Bronco, uh, uh, Dr. Jovanovic, the, the fellow that's in in there. And it's a funny little section. I'm good friends with him. I had dinner with him. Uh, but it doesn't play very well. I guess it, it made good TV. But the yeah. problem was that uh, uh, Dr. Jovanovic, I know him as Bronco, um, is dealing with a bureaucracy in a, they're not a communist country, but they're they have a dark side underneath and he has to show that he's tough uh, or he wouldn't stay there. And so he kind of put up a front and made it hard for me to see the final signature page when Tesla had to deal with the Russians. Okay. And I think I understood he basically needs to say I'm in charge here because if right. I don't show I'm tough, they're going to remove me and they'll put some uh, a person who really doesn't know what they're doing. So he's been involved in the Tesla Museum ever, ever since I've known him, which is 1986. So we've been mm -hmm. good friends for 30 years. So does the museum have actual um, creations of Tesla's or only reproductions? Tesla saved everything. 
He yeah. has 200,000 or more documents. He saved letters from ev everybody, you can imagine. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can see in these two books all the letters that I was able to access from the museum. Um, there's almost no equipment uh, that survived. Um, I have this article. I should show it to you. It's a funny story. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, when Tesla was getting um, his, um, uh, he wanted to get his motor tested. He sent this motor up to, to Cornell University. And um, uh, William Anthony, who was a very well-known established professor of electrical engineering, studied it said, this is great, I highly recommend it. And that's the reason why his motor went in at Niagara Falls. Jump a hundred years later, it looks like a piece of junk. <laughs> and so uh, Bill Weissach was a very good friend of mine who was building these gigantic Tesla coils. He's no longer on the planet. He got a hold of this thing. He brought it to the porn brokers, the, the television show. They said, it's a piece of junk. He knew it was Tesla's machine. He brought it for the fun of it. And they said, it's not worth anything. You can't put a price on it. So this one lady got a hold of this. He, she bought it from Weissach and she wants, you know, 80 or a hundred thousand dollars for it. And it's, it's priceless because it really is Tesla's first uh, working motor. Um, wow. And I think she should donate it to the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the story of that whole. Uh, aspect. Is there any of his, uh, any, any of his work in the Smithsonian now? Not that I know of. And so they reproduced like his uh, remote control robotic boat at at the uh, museum. And they reproduced a little tiny model of his flivver plane, which is a plane that takes off like a helicopter. And then the the uh, uh, the uh, propeller rotates into the into the airplane position that right. became the Osprey helicopter airplane. Now, if you Google the Osprey, you will not find Tesla's name, maybe by now because of our television show, but he's the inventor of a $70 million military plane. Um, they hid his name. And when they sat on his papers for 10 years, after he died, after Trump looked at the papers, they were, I, un I uh, um, uncovered a battle between two different people. Trump said, eh, Tesla, don't worry about it. You you can hand that stuff over to the to the uh, uh, the commies who was, was Yugoslavia, and I, we don't care if the Russians get get his stuff. And yeah. uh, General L.C. Craigie, who was uh, working at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, said, wait a second, Tesla was a brilliant man. We have to look at these papers. Right. And so they kept the papers for 10 years, and we don't know if they sent everything over to the museum. Uh, but they did send the secret particle beam weapon to the museum. Um, the Russians already had had it because Tesla had sold it to them. Uh, but they used his... Uh, his information, for instance, they came up with uh, the Osprey helicopter airplane, and the only way they could come up with it was by looking at Tesla's patent from uh, 1929 uh, on this invention. So that do you, do you feel then that that was the idea of them going in and removing everything from his hotel room after his passing? That they just wanted to review everything and glean as many ideas from him as possible. Yes, what I really focus in on on this book, Wizard at War, you have to look at the date. Van Eva Bush is now the head of the Manhattan Project. And Einstein sends a letter to Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States, and says the Russians, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the Nazis are working on the uh, on the atom bomb. If they get an atom bomb, they're going to win the war. <clears throat> and we're not yet in the war. We didn't get into the war about 1941, end of 41. Um, and so Bush, there was kind of an ego thing told, told Roosevelt, we, you know, we've been studying the bomb long before you got this letter from, from Einstein. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, we uncovered a letter from Franklin Roosevelt saying we should bring Tesla in because he's got a particle beam weapon. If the Germans get the nuclear weapon, they're going to fly it over and they could drop it on New York or they could drop it on Washington, D.C. Sure. Right. Maybe we'll need his uh, his death ray to shoot down incoming planes. So let's study both of these things. And that's one of the reasons they, they kept the papers. So that's really, I think, the reason. So you have to uh, see it within the context of why they were sitting on the papers for 10 years. That's because we were in the midst of World War II and, uh, and clearly... 
had uh, Hitler uh, built the bomb before we would have, he would have won the war. And when you really study uh, World War II, you realize how close Hitler actually came to winning the war. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, it's my understanding from, um, again, things that uh, uh, I've read and obviously seen on your series, the, the death ray, which is uh, it's quite the name for it. It's a laser, right? No, it's not a laser. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> what? What Tesla realized, if you take a flashlight and you shine it out, it spreads out. So if you mm -hmm. have a, a death ray, the right. ray will spread out and lose all of its power over distance. You know, it's over the square of the distance. It loses it very rapidly. He had to come up with a way to concentrate the energy. I think he invented a laser beam in the 1890s, but he didn't realize what he really had. Right. I discuss it in, in, in this, that he talked about a pencil line of light and he was sending electricity through a ruby. So he, he probably invented a ruby laser, but he had so many different things. He didn't focus on this. So he was trying to figure out how can I send a beam of energy where it won't dissipate the way a ray would dissipate. So it's not really a ray. He came up with shooting tiny little particles of tungsten. So it's a particle beam weapon. So it's tiny little bullets, almost microscopic bullets. So you can send this stream of microscopic bullets. They're not, they can't spread out because they're actually literally bullets. So he, and he uses the power of repulsion. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the death ray is really a particle beam weapon and it's a cannon set up. And he has kind of like the uh, uh, Van de Graaff generator, a belt of electrical mm -hmm. energy that's say negative charge and the particles are charged negatively. So when a negative meets a negative, it's repelled yeah. out and that's how it works. Um, so they uh, they were using that concept uh, uh, right now. The rail gun uh, works yeah. on that concept. Um, and so they were definitely studying his stuff. And, and John Trump, right. uh, Tesla's uncle, was really wrong. There was every reason to keep the papers and, and Trump was dismissing him. There's a lot of people that were very prejudiced against Tesla, and he frankly was one of them. Um, and the head of Bell Labs was another one. And uh, and yet Bell Labs is the, the, are the people that uh, created the first uh, Osprey helicopter airplane. So they were secretly studying his stuff and dismissing him uh, to the public eye. He was you know he was the sole guy just feeding the pigeons. <clears throat> what I realized in, in writing the next and second book. We have this image of this old man just feeding pigeons, you know, as he disappears from history. But in fact, at that time, as World War II was underway, he was negotiating with the head of secret weapons development for the British Empire and with the head of secret weapons development uh, through Ralph Bergstresser, who was working for military intelligence uh, for the U.S. government and through Joseph Stalin uh, when we were when we was, you know, partners with, with Stalin when they, they were not a, an enemy of us. So Tesla had said at one time too that you know that he had a weapon that could destroy a city. Was that the particle, the the death ray, or is that another weapon that he was uh, developing? I think that was more Prometheus Films uh, using that line uh, uh, to say okay. how powerful it was. It wasn't really. It was more set up to shoot down planes than to ex than to explode cities. So it was really a line that I was. I, Prometheus was great. They did an incredibly great job, but there was a yeah, few yeah. things that they, they did that I, I tried to uh, dissuade them from, from doing. That was one of them, but I lost that little battle. And so that was one of them. <laughs> yeah. It's like so I've heard people, because you, you, you got made. <laughs> I, I've heard people compare um, Elon Musk to Tesla, uh, you know, because of SpaceX and all that. Um, what do you think Tesla would think of Musk's work and do you see any similarities between them? Yes, I think Elon Musk is the, the Nikola Tesla of today, but maybe also mm -hmm. the Edison of today because he's so much more successful, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur. He also seems to have this wacky side, you know, paying $45 million, for, $45 billion for Twitter. We're trying yeah. to get him to just give us 20 or 30 million, which is pocket change to him to help uh, rebuild Wardenclyffe. He did give us a million dollars, uh, yeah. but... Um, I, if he ever watches this, Elon, you can write a check for 15 or 20 million. Let's finish Wardenclyffe, make a museum there. <clears throat> Tesla Motors was not 
invented by Elon Musk. Uh, Tesla Motors Correct. Uh, was uh, invented by two other fellows who read an article that Tesla wrote in 1905 that a motor, mm -hmm. electrical motor, would be a much better way to do it than a gas-run motor. And that's what started them. So when they built the uh, Tesla Motors, uh, they uh, Elon Musk purchased it. And he was actually considering changing the name of the company to Edison Motors. Thankfully, he didn't. Uh, but the real company is based on Tesla's invention. And I do mm -hmm. think Elon Musk, uh, on the positive side, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. I think the concept of sending a rocket ship up and then having the, the part that leaves to land on a barge in the, you know in the ocean that's a measure of real genius and i think yeah. both of these people for me and you ask you know why was i so interested in him uh tesla wrote an article uh, called man's greatest achievement and man's greatest achievement in this article he has a balanced scale and on one scale is a newborn baby and on the other scale is all of man's creations trains buildings you know uh airplanes they're like this and the baby is like this what tesla is saying is our brain is much more powerful each of our brains is much more powerful than all of human creation and so mm -hmm. that really exactly. is you know his message and that and that's why i was inspired I, he's, right. he inspires us to, to become better people to to work you know to in, in, enlarge who we are mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that uh, has always stuck with me is that when uh, when uh, Elon Musk went to Russia to look at their rocket program, that when he left, he says, there has got to be a better way, you know, because he didn't agree with the disposable rockets. He goes, you know, this is such a waste of money. And I thought that from for years and years and years. And it's like, my God, they just keep throwing this stuff away. Um, but he was somebody who just said, yeah, I'm going to do something about it. And, uh, I mean, now when you, when, the first time I saw one of his rockets land, land back on the, uh, on the barge, it reminded me of like a 1955, you know, from earth to the moon movie where, you know, you, you actually see the whole rocket come back and land. I'm just like, you know, I says, he, I don't think he reinvented something. I think he just saw something when he was a kid and went. I think that's the way it should be. That makes the most sense. So um, it's it's pretty amazing. So um, let's talk about Colorado Springs um, because I is that's when I think a lot of people really, when he really kind of got the national attention. Do you believe? Yeah, um, I, he was world famous by then. Before we get into that, though, okay. I, I look at these rocket ships and I see all the waste of fuel. My gut feeling is that we should be able to send, uh, I think the UFOs, those spinning things. I think it's a, a electromagnetic way to leave Earth's atmosphere and get to the moon without using all that fuel. I just believe that deep inside, but I, I got too many things going on, so I'm not gonna end up inventing that thing. So it's just, it's a call uh, to uh, somebody out there to figure out how to uh, you know leave the Earth's atmosphere without using so much fuel, but no, Tesla was world famous uh, because of the hydroelectric power system and speaking at Niagara Falls. When he spoke at uh, in um, St. Louis, they there were so many people. I think somewhere between three and four thousand people attended his lecture. They had to move to a larger auditorium. Uh, he spoke in Philadelphia. He spoke in New York. He's sending electricity through his body and showing wireless communication while Marconi was still in high school. Um, so he was world famous. When he went out to Colorado Springs, very few people really knew about it. It was more done in secret. He wanted to come back and make this huge announcement that he would light the Paris Exposition from uh, from Wardenclyffe, um, which he probably would have achieved had he, had he uh, not run out of money. Um, so his fame really was in, in, the, in the 1890s. And his fame started to take a nosedive um, after he he uh, blew it at Wardenclyffe. And, and what I uncover in uh, in Wizard was that when Morgan gave him one hundred fifty thousand dollars, now today even today one hundred fifty thousand, I wouldn't mind getting a check for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money today. That's equivalent to at least fifteen or twenty million dollars. He got a lot of money, 
and yeah. he read an article uh, written by Marconi. He had offered Marconi through Sir William Priest uh, his equipment. He said, use my equipment. It's better than your equipment. And Marconi said, no, I don't need your equipment. And so then Marconi wrote a letter, uh, an article in an electrical magazine, which said, you want to uh, do wireless communication? You take something like a Tesla coil and you do this, that, and the other. And Tesla freaked out. He's using my Tesla coil, but he said, but I offered it to him. He's, he's not doing it. So he decides, Tesla decides to double the size of Wardenclyffe. Wardenclyffe was supposed to be a 90-foot tower. A 90-foot tower, according to Tesla's calculations, would have got him to Europe. A 187-foot tower would have gotten him to China and Australia. So he was trying to tell Morgan, if I double the size of the tower, even though the cost will be double, the revenues will come in at a much more rapid rate because I, I won't. it's not just double the area. It's, it's a much bigger area. So it makes economic sense to build a larger tower to cover a wider area. And all Morgan could see is, wait a second, I gave you $150,000 to build a tower of 90 feet, and you're telling me that you double the size of the tower and you're running out of money and you're blaming me? Uh, so that was the, the heart and soul of the, of the cause of the, of the problem between them. Tesla sowed the seeds of his own destruction by breaching the contract and then expecting Morgan to, uh, to understand that if you believe in me, I know I'm going to come through. And he probably would have succeeded uh, had he gotten the money. But Morgan took it a step further. Morgan didn't just stop paying Tesla. Morgan also blocked Tesla from getting money from other investors. And these people included someone like um, Henry Clay Frick. When Morgan created U U U.S. Steel, it was the first billion dollar company. Carnegie got $350 million. Frick got $60 million. That's then. That's billions of dollars in today's dollars. And Frick lived in the world of Astoria. Tesla lived in the world of Astoria. Tesla's meeting with Frick. Te Tesla sells, tells Frick, meet with Morgan. Uh, I just need another 100000 to complete the tower. T Frick meets with Morgan. Uh, Thomas Fortune Ma Ryan meets with Morgan. Jacob Schiff meets with Morgan. And Morgan blocks Tesla at every uh, chance. Now, why does he ultimately block him? That's always remained a mystery. We can speculate the reason why, that maybe he was afraid that Tesla would succeed. And if he succeeded in, in uh, transmitting power, how would you build power? They didn't have computers then. How do you build mm -hmm. a phone without a, without a line going to everyone's house? Right. Um, so more yeah, because whether people are not or not, I mean, he was really into, you know, the idea of free energy for everyone, right? So do you think it's possible to achieve something like that today? Or do you feel that we're too dependent on traditional power sources? What Tesla felt was that the money would come in in a different way. You wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, be uh, getting paid for every call that they would make, but you'd get paid for the equipment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the reverse happened when I was you know, getting my hmm. uh, master's degree. Like an iPhone. This was in the yeah. 1970s. And uh, a friend of mine was going to go into cable TV. I said, what are you, nuts? I'm watching TV for free. <laughs> you know, it's going through the airwaves. I thought right. it was nuts. And now we're all nuts because we're all paying right. 300 bucks a month, you know, to watch TV uh, when we had it for free. Uh, yeah. So. You're asking a, a very <laughs> difficult question. That, uh, they'll figure out a way to make money no matter how we do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, isn't that um, that same premise the why there was really such a long delay in the um, advent of the electric car? So, um, I mean, I studied that for um, quite some time when uh, the electric cars are coming out. And one of the things that I was kind of like well oh electric cars have been around for a long time but this is like yeah but they you know the you know the oil companies and the actual car companies themselves they really really pushed against it because it was going to step on their toes oil companies especially like well no mm -hmm. we we make our money off of gasoline we don't want this invisible electricity to you know take away our our business um, isn't a, a lot of that and uh, more of that capitalistic type of, of thought process kind of what holds back some of these incredible ideas? 
Yes, for instance, in a very fact. limited way, because as we've said, you know, when um, uh, you know when the uh, when the internet came about, and you know, people say, well, now we're going to be a paperless society, and it's just like, look at me, and and everybody's going to lose all their jobs. It's just like, look how many jobs have been created, and how much wealth has been created because of this limited, but these people who had this limited thinking in the beginning were were putting it out because they were the ones that were going to lose because they couldn't or couldn't or did not want to adapt. Yeah, I, I liken it to if suppose Kodak was in charge of the world, we would never have <laughs> phones. You know, we didn't have a camera on my phone. And they had and they had, if I if I recall right, they had first ops at the digital camera. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they turned it down. They're like, oh, that's that's bunk. There's just no way. Film will be around for centuries. Right. And uh, in, well, in and Tesla's there, case, Morgan had copper mines uh, out west. He had lumber yards in, in, even in Alaska. And he had rubber plantations in Africa. So he yeah. wanted rubber. He wanted copper. And he wanted, uh, you know, lumber. Uh, he was going to lose all of that in a, in a, yeah. in a true wireless uh, environment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's phenomenal. Um, so, all right. So Tesla went to Colorado Springs. He built his first tower, which was relatively small. And then he wanted to, what was the reason that he went to, uh, ended up in Long Island? He wanted to build a better tower or that's where Morgan said, I want you to be. Well, he went to Colorado to send electricity around the world. He couldn't do it in his laboratory. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had free electricity uh, out there uh, at Colorado Springs. And he was measuring uh, electrical storms at distances of 600 miles away. He could follow up the Rockies. Uh, so if he could pick up, if he could detect an electrical storm 600 miles away, he didn't have to march out 600 miles and send an impulse to see if his equipment would pick it up. So he was doing it that way. So he was building the equipment. Uh, but his initial idea was to send it through the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere. So he had balloons that he had erected. And he was going to try and beam the electricity up to this other area where, where it would be uh, more economical. Uh, the, the electricity would, would go through the atmosphere easier than through the lower uh, atmosphere. Uh, but he found that too difficult. And he and so during electrical storms, he began to uh, test the rebound, and he felt that these some of these um, uh, lightning bolts would actually reverberate entire the, around the entire planet. And he measured the resonant frequency of the Earth, which is about twelve cycles a second. So once he realized that the uh, that the Earth had its own resonant frequency, he could use that as a carrier wave. And so his next idea was to send energy through the earth. <clears throat> so when he came back to uh, Long Island, he, he didn't want to leave New York City. He was living in the New York City at the height of the Gilded Age. He was friends with Rudyard Kipling and Mark Twain and John Muir and Robin uh, Johnson, who was editor of Century Magazine. I mean, he was, he was a star of the Gilded Age among stars. He was friends with John Jacob Astor, who owned who owned uh, uh, the world of Astoria, who actually gave him money, which he used to go out to Colorado Springs. So he missed New York. And so he, what he should have done, and he knew this, was he should have built the tower at Niagara Falls, which was very close to uh, the power source. Uh, but Niagara Falls is 10 hours away by train. Um, so he built it out on Long Island instead, which meant that he needed coal. It ran, it ran on coal and wood. Uh, this power station but his idea when you look at a picture of the of the tower you, you can see it here it looks like a mushroom the electricity is not coming off the top but that's mm -hmm. where the electricity is being collected it's being driven down into the earth and he's sending it through the earth and what right. he's saying is that the earth acts as a conductor and i can send 97 or 98 percent of electrical power all the way to England, if I want, all the way to France. So essentially, he's like tapping into like a, a, a mycelial network. Yeah, ley lines or whatever. I mean, it, it, very it's, cool. That was his concept. And mm -hmm. so I found an article in the New York Times. It's in both, both books 
where Tesla was hired by uh, the Sayville plant, which was run by the Germans. The Germans had secretly built this, and then then they started hiring a lot of Germans and and uh, immigrants, German immigrants, uh, were running this thing as, as World War One began. And they hire Tesla, and Tesla goes out. It's, it's also out on Long Island. And Tesla says to them right off the bat, "You're sending all this energy through the through the atmosphere, like Marconi. You know, you don't want to do that. You need a much better ground connection." So hmm. they greatly increase their ground connection, and and the article in the New York Times which is referenced in both these books, is that on whatever it was date, on July so-and-so in 1915, um, Sayville plant becomes the, the most powerful plant on the planet. It triples its power. How does it triple its power? Because it listened to Tesla and send electricity through the earth. So that's how it worked. Uh, you didn't need wires. The earth itself would be the conductor. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's really what his, his plan was. He's driving the power through the earth. And that's what we have the tunnels. We discovered the tunnels mm -hmm. uh, in uh, at, at, in uh, the Tesla files. And we found the earth grippers, which uh, are these right. uh, ways to mm -hmm. actually attach to the earth. So when you send the electricity mm -hmm. out, you can beam it to all over the place. And he was going to build this kind of tower all over uh, the planet. And right. he actually calculated that sometimes they have to be higher or lower depending on the size because it's a little bit wide at the at, at the equator. He was calculating all these different things wow. that they wouldn't be the exact same size. So speaking of the Germans, do is there any kind of uh, theory that the Diglock was something that they copied or were trying to copy from Tesla? Uh, what What is the Diglock? Well, that's the thing. They don't know. They it's the bell, the the German bell that they they did they discovered in uh, a lot of the files after World War II, um, and it looked like a bell. But there's been so many different rumors, um, and even on the even in the series, they said that the platform that uh, the tower in Long Island, the platform was the exact proportion. Ex maybe not exact proportion, but the exact shape of a die Glock that they that they found in Germany. But there it's was, there was no actual real connection to um, what it was for. I mean, the they, Germans that, were meeting with Tesla. Right. They were Nazis at that point. Mm -hmm. so Tesla did not uh, negotiate with them, but they were there. They knocked on his door. They came to his place. Right. Um, and they were... The, you know, the, and we were still neutral at that time, so there was nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, and there were a number of, you know, prominent Americans that, that were uh, Nazi sympathizers. Henry Ford was one, and uh, Charles Lindbergh, believe it or not, was another. Yeah, a lot of them were in New York as well. Yeah. Uh, they the used house. to have these big, uh, big pageants and parades and such because it was just they they weren't the Nazis we know of today. They that was it was just a, another type of movement. So. Um, anyhow, the die Glock has just been this big mystery that everybody, you know, a lot of it falls under the conspiracy realm because they've thought that, well, was it some sort of transportation or was it a transporter? Was it a multidimensional, you know, uh, uh, chamber of some sort? And, uh, when they, mentioned it in the series i'm just like oh it was just to con conduct electricity that would be more more relevant than uh some of the other you know kind of crazy theories that they've had out there but uh it was just kind of uh something that that uh, kind of popped up and i'm like oh well that would make the most sense and since you said that that, that they have been had been in touch with uh tesla um i'm like okay well that might be a that might be a possibility you know, I had a, a parasite. Tesla problem. didn't really get into, I mean, he was more of the down, for the lack of a better term, the down to earth kind of uh, inventor. I mean, he was, uh, you know, he wasn't into time travel or, you know, creating molecular transporters or anything like that. He was just like, I want to send signals and I want to send electricity across the globe. Or was yeah. he? I mean, did he get into some of that? That uh, you know, I well, he believed stuff? in in, in uh, extraterrestrial communication. Even right to the day he died, he believed that this was possible. And in the last chapter of uh, Wizard at War, 
I get into, uh, it's called uh, grand unification. What happened was Einstein spent the last 35 years of his life trying to combine uh, electri uh, 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 electromagnetism with gravity. There were four forces to the universe. There's gravity, electromagnetism, there's strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force uh, holds the neutron together, which is the proton and electron. The strong nuclear force holds the uh, uh, the nucleus together. Electromagnetism holds uh, molecules together, and gravity holds like the Earth together. So they've been able to combine uh, the strong and weak nuclear force with electromagnetism, but they've been unable to combine it with gravity. And um, one of the things that I discovered was when an electron is traveling around the uh, the nucleus, uh, there were three uh, numbers that, that explained its position, you know, uh, height, width, and depth kind of thing, you know, there's three positions, uh, but it, it didn't explain it all. So uh, 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 Goodsmith and Uhlenbeck, 1925 or thereabouts, said that there must be a fourth number that's involved, that we think it's particle spin. Uh, so they added particle spin. So now there are four uh, numbers which explain where an electron is as it's going around the nucleus. Three, it's, it's point in space by three uh, dimensions. And the fourth is, is, uh, is particle spin. What happened, though, was when they did the calculations, they found that the particle was spinning faster than the speed of light. It was violating mm -hmm. Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, this is all in uh, the book um, uh, written by uh, Gamow, uh, 30 Years That Shook Physics. And uh, I have it up there. That's what I'm looking at. <clears throat> so I'm reading this and go, wow, they measured particle spin and particles are spinning faster than the speed of light. Now, Tesla had his dynamic theory of gravity. Tesla's dynamic theory of gravity is that everything is absorbing energy all of the time. I never totally understood what gravity was, and I always joke about it, but how come they don't fall off the earth? You know, in, in Australia, you know, they're upside down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, but on some level, I still don't totally get it, you know? But if, if anything, if everything absorbing energy, so, you know, this thing is absorbing energy. This is absorbing energy, but the earth is absorbing a tremendous amount of energy. And so what gravity is, according to Tesla, is we get in the way of this influx. When you jump up, the reason why you go back to the Earth, you're not attracted to the Earth. You're in the way of the influx of energy that's being absorbed, just like, mm. you know, this phone, this physical thing is absorbing energy. That's mm -hmm. his dynamic theory of gravity. <clears throat> so if everything is absorbing energy, I started to put it all together. I said, well, then that would mean that the electrons are absorbing energy. And if the electrons are absorbing energy at a tachyonic rate faster than the speed of light, that would be a way to combine Tesla's dynamic theory of gravity, all, and all matter is absorbing energy all the time with electromagnetism. That's a way to create grand unification. So what's happening, according to my view of what's going on here, is that electrons are spinning at a tachyonic rate. And now what do they do with that energy? They transform it into electromagnetism. So all atoms are standing waveforms. They're constantly absorbing energy from the ether. And here's where Tesla comes in to answer your, your question about the, the mystical side of all of this. Tesla believed that the ether was operating in a tachyonic realm, that it was oscillating at a frequency much faster than the speed of light. Um, so I think that I actually, I think I deserve a Nobel Prize. I mean, I think I've, I've you know, at least theoretically, um, solved what Einstein spent, you know, 35 years of his life um, trying to figure out. Now, what happened is Dirac came along and, uh, you know, Einstein took uh, uh, three coordinates of space and 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 time. Uh, he They called time the square root of negative one. If you use the imaginary number, the square root of negative one, you can combine space with time. You can make the square root of negative one equivalent to the three coordinates of space. That's what space time, the Einsteinian space time mm. continuum is all about. What Dirac did was he did the same thing with particle spin. Instead of saying that it's violating relativity, 
let's call it the square root of negative one. Let's use that imaginary number. So that's the fourth component of the other three components to tell you where the electron is when it's when it's spinning around. So by changing particle spin to, uh, instead of violating rel relativity, if we call it the square, square root of negative one, we can then combine it with, uh, with uh, all these three numbers, which tell you the other positions of the electron. And Dirac got a Nobel Prize for uh, figuring out how to combine Einstein's theory uh, of relativity with, uh, with quantum physics. And, and, and so what happened was the concept that electron spin is faster than the speed of light went the way of the passenger pigeon. If you Google it, you'll be lucky if you find it in uh, um, Gamow's book. Gamow was one of the, he's friends with Einstein and Bohr and every, you know, he's, he's one of the major com, uh, players in, in there. But you can't find it. You'll find my name will pop up. Uh, they've, <laughs> they've hidden that it, because it, it violates relativity. I think we all, if we ever want to have, if we ever want to leave the solar system, we've got to travel faster than the speed of light. And that's what hyperspace is all about. And I, I think it, it exists. There's, there's got to be a way to pop into hyperspace if there is a way to, you know, get to another star system. You, you have to leave this system. The other point I try to make is if you look at a galaxy, a galaxy is one thing. We see there's one thing. Is the, if the galaxy is one thing, is one side of itself attached instantaneously to the other side? Because if it's traveling only at the speed of light, it takes 100,000 years for light to travel across from one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy at 186,000 miles a second. That's just one galaxy. Um, so it's it, it's really mind-blowing what what's going on here. But Tesla ultimately, I think, understood that the ether, that the substrate which 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 the earth which all of matter is built on is operating in a, in a tachyonic realm it's oscillating faster than the speed of light so um i one of the things that i found interesting was uh that in, in many different places i've seen and heard over the years his fascination and i don't know the truth in the and the fact and the and the reality of this, but his fascination with the numbers of three, six, and nine. You, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, a, a segment of three things there just a second ago. So that kind of sparked that for me. Um, is that a thing? Like, you know, the, the, the quote is, you know, if you only knew the magnificence of the three, six, and nine, then you would have the, the key to the universe. Is that a thing or is that a myth? We think it's a myth. Um, okay. Uh, Bronco, the head of the Tesla Museum, myself and other people have searched all over uh, to try and find a direct quote from Tesla where he said that. It sounds great. I love that quote, but yeah. we cannot attribute it to Tesla. Um, he certainly was definitely involved with numbers, mystical side of numbers. He circled a block three times before he went in there. But the three, six and nine thing, I think it's linked to the anagram and stuff. Um, I yeah, think in numerology, right? So, did he have a pendant? There, there's, there's also things that he had a pendant that represented the numerology of the three, six, and nine. Yeah, we think it's a myth. Um, no one's been able to find a direct quote. And Tesla, as I said, he saved everything. Um, mm -hmm. I've been studying for forty years, and I've yet to find that quote. Um, and hmm. and that's what you know. These two books, they're all I cite every source. Nothing is made that's up. Great. Um, because we want to know, you know, what it's all about. And the fact that he saved everything, he saved a letter. If Aunt Tilly wrote him, he saved a letter from Aunt Tilly, you know, uh, and Aunt Tilly's brother who lived in Iowa wrote him, he saved that letter. I mean, he saved everything. Yeah. Well, you know, that's another thing. So that's that's a quirk and a, a idiosyncrasy that I think a lot of people don't know about him, right? And and the pigeons thing too is is probably the most popular thing. What what do you think is a you know having researched him as as much as you have? What do you think is a quirk or innocent idiosyncrasy that he had that not a lot of people know about? Well, I I think that to me he had a great sense of humor. And people hmm. forget that. They think of him as a serious scientist. <clears throat> My favorite uh, story that he tells is he goes out to lunch with Rudyard Kipling and he writes to Katherine Johnson and he says, what's the matter with Ink Spiller Kipling? He dared to take me to some seedy restaurant in Greenwich Village where, where I was uh, sure to find hair and cockroaches in the soup. It's just, you know, it's just funny. He had a great <laughs> sense of humor. Uh, 
So I think, you know, I'm interested in the concept of hip. When when were people hip? You know, did they all of a sudden become hip? Yeah. Now? But Tesla was hip. Stanford White was hip. His friends were hip. Catherine Johnson and Robert Johnson were hip. <laughs> Mark Twain, of course, was hip. You don't get any hipper than Mark Twain. And really? he was hip. Um, I think another thing that people forget about him, he, everyone wanted to be with him. Um, I found a letter from uh, Stanford hmm. White. Stanford White designed the Capitol here in Providence, the Towers in Narragansett, Rosecliff, and uh, Manchester, uh, and the Tennis Hall of Fame, and also in the original Madison Square Garden. He writes to Tesla, come on on my boat. You're working too hard. I'd rather be with you than the King of England. Now, why would he write that? Because Tesla was fun to be with. Um, Tesla was brilliant. Hmm. He could speak nine different languages. He he knew wow. Shakespeare and all these kinds of things. So I th so he was so multidimensional. He was also a great writer. And when you read his autobiography, he talks about this goose that was after him, and he, he was running around naked as a little kid. And the goose grabs his his stomach. And the way he writes about how he almost he turned him inside out when he pulled when he when the goose pulled out his stomach because he had thrown a rock at the goose. Don't ever make an enemy of the goose. So he he really I think that's another aspect of him that people just forget about. And that's pretty cool. That is. That's pretty cool. Okay. Well, I have okay. one more question. What because because we we've gone way over time, but that, I just want to make sure I want to get this out. So is there anyone on this, your? This is going to be a this is going to be a longer one. We're there's okay. we're halfway through. <laughs> yeah. Is is there anyone on your radar? that's alive today who's doing groundbreaking kind of stuff that would match what Tesla was doing? Like someone who's grassroots and not yet recognized it, because you're in this field and, and, and you're, you're, you're studying it so much. Is there anyone that kind of comes to mind on the radar that we should be looking out for? And... I honestly, I, you know, I wish I could tell you other people, but I honestly believe my discussion of grand unification needs to be looked at seriously. I really mm -hmm. think, I mean, Einstein spent 35, 40 years trying to combine gravity with electromagnetism, and I pretty much explained it to you. Um, so I really think uh, that I'm one of those guys. I, I really oh, believe great. it. And, and I got there by studying Tesla and by studying Einstein and by studying George Gamow. What I liked about Gamow, I read a number of his books. I could understand them. I, I can't do all those calculations. I can't. Mm -hmm. I, physics, I, I at some point, I was... a a double on a student math uh, uh, to some extent, but it's beyond me. But conceptually, um, I, I would say that. But uh, so I would, I would just point to that that theory, which I think is. So let's, is, let's follow up on that then. So are you actively involved, and in, if you can say, in any uh, experiments with like experimentation stuff, and that's that's moving towards the, that realization. You know, I, one of the reasons I asked Ross where he was from, and I, I didn't follow up on it, <clears throat> was uh, the whole thing with COVID. I wrote mm -hmm. this book, too. It's called Ozone Therapy for the Treatment mm -hmm. of Viruses. Tesla yeah. uh, invented an ozone machine. And Tesla was selling these ozone machines to medical personnel. Ozone is something that our own body manufactures. Um so one person you're asking on the forefront, I think would be Paul Wentworth. Hmm. He discovered in 2001 that our own antibodies manufacture ozone. And what happened, I, I know this to be true. I wish it wasn't true. This COVID pandemic did not have to happen. They knew that ozone therapy would have knocked out the virus. Ozone therapy is mostly um, oxygen. It's 97% pure oxygen, 3% ozone. It's injected into the body. It kills mm. uh, viruses. Um, they needed the eight or nine months to create the vaccines. And by uh, creating the vaccines, they allowed a million people in America to die. 15 million people around the world died. And we, you know, the tragedy mm. that we had. And so Tesla was on the forefront of that. So if you're asking someone today, I think Paul Wentworth, uh, this de deserves a Nobel Prize for discovering that our own antibodies manufacture ozone. So the, the question that I raise is when we look at hundreds and hundreds and thousands of articles on COVID, find me a single article which explains how the vaccines kill the virus. The vaccines, of course, don't kill the virus. We kill the virus. 
What the yeah, vaccine exactly. does, it alerts the body, and then it's our own antibodies. Now, how do our right. antibodies do it? We manufacture two things in particular. We manufacture hydrogen peroxide, and we manufacture ozone. Uh, President Trump, unfortunately, misunderstood that. Uh, and he hmm. talked about drinking oh, yeah. bleach. Those <laughs> are two forms of bleach. Uh, had, he done, had he spent a little bit more time researching, he would have understood, uh, he would have came close to, to having stopped this pandemic. It's, you don't drink bleach, but what yeah. you do is you inject a form of bleach, which is ozone. Uh, it kills um, uh, viruses, and it would have stopped this pandemic. So what I wanted to, to say, Ross, uh, was that I was going to look up ozone therapists in your area because if you have long COVID, that kind of thing, it it can end all that. Yeah, it can end all that. Um, so I'm going to try and see if I can find some ozone therapists. Yeah, in, that'd be cool. Email yeah. it to me. That'd be awesome. Okay, so I want to get I I want to use the last uh, the last time that we've got here. I really really want to talk about the New Yorker Hotel. Sure. So in in your series, they were, um, well, before I go there, is there going to be a season two? Unfortunately, no. I wish there was. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the the the, uh, the producers. Prometheus Films, they do Ancient Aliens. They are super wonderful, great people. It was yeah. the History Channel. We got replaced by uh, people that uh, look for alligators in the swamp. They knocked yeah. us out, and they didn't even show the whole uh, series the way it should have been shown. Um, they, they, I don't know why they were into into killing uh, alligators and into knives that can you know cut into steel. I mean, so the, yeah. we got replaced by that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, that's too bad. So, because um, there's five good episodes that are just keep you on the edge of your seat. And you you need, so, needed an episode where you talked about how um, Tesla would wrestle alligators. That's in there's there wasn't enough drama. Or enough. <laughs> I blew it. I should have thought of that. I, or, or hunt him with his death ray. <laughs> I would have done but, it. Uh, okay, so there was a theory that was launched, um, and I I really want to follow up with you to see if there was any other follow up that the that the New Yorker Hotel was actually a pseudo Wardenclyffe Tower type of of uh, facility. Um, where did that end up going? Um, was there any definitive information or was there any more notes in, in Tesla's uh, uh, diaries that, uh, that that's what his intention was with the New Yorker? Yeah, Travis Taylor came up with that idea. Yeah. Travis is a wonderful guy. He's He's got two PhDs. He's got top secret clearance. He's the real deal. Uh, and he came up with the idea that, that, that Wardenclyffe, I mean, that the New Yorker itself was a Wardenclyffe. It was 600 feet tall. There were tunnels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we found a, a room. The, the top of the hotel is an attic. And there is a room there that would make sense that if he had a lab, it would be there. The problem with that theory was Tesla was old. He was in his 80s. Yes. And he, if you look at him, the last six years of his life, he was pretty frail. Um, so I, I don't think he did very many experiments. He was actually, even up until the, literally the day he died, negotiating uh, with the U.S. government, uh, working with Ralph Burke Stresser, giving them the details of the particle beam weapon. Um, he was really there. But <laughs> I think he was an anorexic. I think he stopped basically eating. Um, he's very t way too thin, uh, yeah, and he yes. had a lot of self denial. Um, so I thought it was a great theory. Um, we're, we're working on a film right now. I'm working with Robert Harris, who is the past president of Universal Television and, and also the president of Imagine Films, which is the Ron Howard company. We're working on a motion picture, and we're going to one way or another use the idea that he had a laboratory you know, in uh, in the hotel, and he may have. Um, but I thought it was a brilliant theory. I I do know for sure, and I mentioned it in in this book, that he did uh, want to set up his uh, wireless system in um, in the Woolworth building. The Woolworth building is even taller. It's eight it's eight hundred some odd feet tall. It was it was the tallest building in New York before they built the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting about it, and we discussed this, and I discuss it in the book too, Tesla's room at the Hotel New Yorker. If you look out, you see the um, uh, Empire State Building, and then you see the Chrysler Building. 
The Empire State Building was the site of the Waldorf Astoria, where Tesla lived for 20 years. So he, when he would look out his his room at the at the uh, Empire State Building, we see the Empire State Building. He sees the life that he had when he was living at the height of the Gilded Age of the gay 90s in that very same spot, uh, you know, 30, 40 years earlier. Um, so that, so I think it's a great theory, uh, but mm -hmm. I do think one of the problems was he was simply too old to have really uh, done too many physical uh, work on, at that time. Yeah. And he really didn't have a, I mean, when he was there, he didn't have like a, um, a, uh, a, uh, research assistants or a, a team of any sort, did he? Research well, team. There was a, Leland Anderson was was the the uh, prominent, uh, preeminent Tesla expert, and he speculated Tesla had a a laboratory, secret laboratory underneath the 59th Street Bridge, and uh, it took me a million years. I finally discovered that Zito, one of his workers. Uh, had a machine shop right by the 59th Street Bridge. So I think Tesla was working on the particle beam weapon. I think he was uh, going to the to the 59th Street Bridge right right across the street there, which where his uh, Zito's machine shop was. And Zito's son, Julius uh, Coleman, uh, he also worked with. What I also discovered, I met uh, Julius's uh, daughter-in-law. She said when... Uh, Tesla around 1918 or so, he was, uh, with, he'd go out with Julius, Zito's son, uh, to send uh, beams, bounce them off to the moon. And I think maybe he had a laser, uh, he, that he had some type of a, of a, a, a thin beam that he was using at that time. Um, mm -hmm. He was trying to measure the distance from here to the moon, and he was working on figuring out how to transfer power from the Earth to other planets at that time. Had I not met this lady, there's nothing written about this. I'm the only source uh, for that bit of, bit of information, but it makes right. perfect sense. So to answer your question, I do believe he did was working in a laboratory, and I do believe it was near the 59th Street Bridge, and it was Zito's machine shop. Now, when he when uh, earlier you had said that he was, you know, uh, had either talked about or had an intention of sending signals into space, was that going to be? part of the Wardenclyffe project or was that a whole different uh, um, technology? It was part of the Wardenclyffe project. He, he, it was a multi-dimensional project. Uh, mostly it was gonna be wireless telephone, uh, but he envisioned while, what we're doing right now. He envisioned the, the concept of Zoom um, and he envisioned uh, you know, the idea of transmitting power. He wanted to, for instance, send power to the Sierra Desert from from Wardenclyffe kind of powers. Um, mm -hmm. And he wanted to send energy to other planets. He felt very strongly, strongly believed in what's called the plurality of worlds, that we cannot be the only species out there that's intelligent. And we're now getting all this information about UFOs. Isn't it amazing that the government yeah. is now telling us for sure that they exist? Um, yes. I, I rack my brains because either that's they another can, story. Well, either they can uh, jump into hyperspace or if they can't, then they're either living in under the ocean or living on the dark side of the moon or they're living someplace. Um, or the above. <laughs> mystery. What was that? Or another dimension. Their yeah. dimension. Or above, I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Could be, could be. Mm -hmm. it's a well, that would, that, would actually, that would actually work more with Tesla's theories as far as, or what you were saying, no, your theories, excuse me, that, you know, the vibrational frequencies that they, they're just on a different frequency. It could very well be. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's very possible. How many dimensions are there? Yeah. But I think it's very important to realize that, uh, that Einstein, it, it's a threshold. The speed of light is a threshold. It, it has to be, uh, that's, you know, that's C. C squared, it equals MC squared. You know, the creation of the atom bomb. It, 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 the reason why there's so much energy, because they're telling us that something exists at, at a square to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And I calculated, I think, C cubed. You could instantaneously go from one side of the galaxy to the other side instantaneously at C cubed. So I think it's C would be the, you know, you get to the different dimensions, C squared and then C cubed um, would be the next one. I wrote another book called Transcending the Speed of Light where I get into some of this as well. 
Yeah. Has that has that come out? Yeah, it's been out for a number of years. It's yeah, it gets good reviews. All right. Well, then there's another episode for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of parapsychology in there and uh, synchronicity. Oh, cool. So, yeah. I mean, you know, Tesla, gosh, I mean, he. So we can say from, I mean, he has how many patents? 300? Well, he actually has about 120 fundamental patents. But okay. he has it in all, in all different countries. They come out to a little over 300. Okay. The thing is, his patents lie at the basis of so many industries. That's where I was going. bother to get patents on top of, all, you know, all the little multiple things that you have to tweak this and tweak that. He has the fundamental patent. What he did, he came up with cell phone technology, and it's all in his uh, remote control robotic boat. If you look at the boat, you'll see it has two aerials. Mm -hmm. What Tesla learned was to multiply frequencies. So let's say there's only 10 frequencies available in the universe. That means you could only have 10 cell phones. But if you multiply the frequencies, 10 times 10, you could have 100 cell phones. And if you had 10 times 10 times 10, if you multiply three frequencies, you could have a thousand cell phones. We're not just starting with 10 frequencies, we're starting with thousands of frequencies. But the reason why every single person in this planet can have their own cell phone, and there must be billion different cell phones right now, a billion, a couple of billion, I bet you, different uh, uh, wireless stations, it's because they're multiplying frequencies. Tesla is the inventor of that fundamental concept. Now, there were there were probably 500 patents off of that. And so his 120 patents is, is the bottom. And on top of that, you could have thousands of patents, but he only has about 120. But my point is, they are the fundamental patents behind fluorescent lighting, behind uh, you know the induction motor, behind wireless communication, behind the, the uh, uh, Osprey helicopter airplane, that kind of thing. So does his uh, does he have an estate that actually has any connection to his patents as far as receiving royalties or anything like that? The problem is that patents were dated, you know, lapsed. He had to, you know, renew patents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of my point. Is that so? They all those patents just kind of expired um, after he passed. There wasn't anybody else that could uh, kind of take up the mantle. Right. He had no children, and. Uh... Yes, they had, they had lapsed for many years. No, yeah, for many years. In fact, you know, you mentioned in, by 1915, he was not that well known. In fact, uh, John Stone Stone, who testified on his behalf, who was the head of the Electrical Society when Marconi was suing him, said in his testimony, I didn't really put much uh, stock in, in Tesla and his inventions until I studied them and then realized, yes, we're really, our entire wireless age is built on this. Now, this is the guy who was the head of the Electrical Engineering uh, Society in 1915, who had patents from the turn of the century, he certainly t knew Tesla's name, but hadn't really studied him, hadn't really realized how brilliant he was until he was hired uh, to fight Marconi in, in court. I think that's a very telling thing that uh, Tesla's name disappeared quite rapidly after mm -hmm. uh, after Marconi uh, sent electricity around the world. I think about, you know, uh, who was, you know, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's vice president? You know, you gotta think, you know, uh, who came in second? Who, who did uh, George Bush beat, you know, or who did uh, so-and-so beat? Exactly. Who won, you know, the, the Kansas City just won the, the, the uh, the Super Bowl. Who do they beat? You tend to forget the, the the people that they beat. And Tesla lost out. He he definitely lost out in wireless. And so had he stopped, had he he would have been like uh, Cyrus McCormick and the you know uh, we know him in the cotton gin. If Tesla had stopped, we would know him for the hydroelectric power system. But he just kept going, and he right. just and he disappeared from the history. And he was resurrected for several reasons. I think my book played a, a key role. But he had those fantastic photographs, which re were resurrected when the internet came out. You see him surrounded by all this lightning. I didn't right. realize uh, for many years that those pictures have been surrounded by all that lightning. First of all, the double exposure, they have nothing to do with his actual technology. They were done just for fluff. He talked about PR. He was a PR person. 
He, so he made those pic pictures just to astound you, but really he was sending all the energy into the earth. He didn't want all those sparks. He was just showing off is really what it came down to. That's true. That's interesting to know. So, I mean, he was a driven man and he was driven, it seems, for the for the joy of uh, inventing. I mean, he he seemed like a pure scientist he go, or a pure inventor. It's like, like I, I'm just doing this because this is what I, I have an idea and I want it to come to fruition. And uh, did he really want the fame? I think he, yes. And he wanted the uh, immortality. You know, he has this, uh, you got this, that. this great quote, which I opened the book with so I can find it. It's really, really good. Um, no, I can't find it. <laughs> I'm going to see but if it's the, uh, the, 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 the essence of the quote, though, is that um, that he was on a high. That they would. I kind of see it like I used to surf. I didn't do that much, but every once in a while, if you catch a wave, that kind of feeling. He he uh, enjoyed very much just the process of mm -hmm. inventing and and what that came. But he had that added aspect that his ideas changed the course of history. Yeah. That's why I think he didn't get married. He couldn't afford the time. Exactly. I have to spend all my time inventing here, and here. what I'm doing. You can't be any higher than that. Yeah. Um, and certain people today, Elon Musk is a good example. I think they're filmmakers, you know, Spielberg or something. People like that, they know if I make a really good film, everybody in the world's going to see this thing. And that in itself is a rush. I think the politicians, the good ones, they know that their ideas, you know, uh, when, uh, right. when John Kennedy said, uh, we're going to send a man to the moon in the next 10 years. And it inspired all of us. And then we went ahead and did that. He didn't live to see that. I wish he had. But. It's that kind of feeling that you know that your ideas are changing the world for the good. I'm going to get rid of all that coal, that black smoke into the sky and run on what he called the wheel work of nature. I liken him to Jacques Cousteau. Uh, yeah. Jacques Cousteau was, was my hero growing up as a kid because Jacques Cousteau used the highest forms of technology. Uh, and he used those, the highest forms of technology to study nature. He didn't mm -hmm. pollute the world. He's saying we can use the highest forms to live within nature. But mm -hmm. we live in this crazy society here in Rhode Island. These jerks want to knock down 150 acres to put up um, uh, solar panels. It's like, what? The whole point of solar panels is not to knock down 150 acres, yeah, is exactly. to use energy without interfering with Mother Nature. So you see uh, how crazy the future. The world is. Looking into the future, then, how do you believe Tesla's ideas and principles can con continue to inspire innovation and progress in science, technology, and society as a whole? Like, because you've done so much, and like, if you were kind of say that, hey, based on this stuff, um, here's how it can inspire the future. I, I had another chapter. I had to keep the book down to a certain number of pages, so I didn't have the chapter in there. Uh, maybe I'll do another book, or maybe I'll just write the article. I don't know. But he was very interested in cosmic rays, in harnessing cosmic rays. Um, this book on 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 ozone is very mm -hmm. very important. It, it's it, it's a way to cure many different types of diseases: malaria, polio, um, right. many different diseases. Um, so I think just simply by studying Tesla and his technology, uh, it inspires. I, I love the nature series. Don't you like watching nature on the PBS? You know, it's tapping into that level. And I think that that that's really his message and, and my message. I mean, I, you know, I taught for 40 years. All I wanted was the kids to do well. That that was all I wanted. And I, and I had, I, I think I think in a way, in a similar way as Tesla, because I had certain, I taught psychology. I wanted people to, for instance, know the ego, superego, and it. What were those things? If you understood those things, then you could understand, uh, you know, other things on top of that. But you had to understand that as well. There's, yeah. you know, a lot of teachers, you know, want to get rid of Freud. And I'm thinking, 
man, the guy was a genius. He understood we had a an unconscious, you know. Tesla ignored that aspect of who we are. He he kind of ignored the mystical side, as strange as it might seem, uh, because mm -hmm. he can't get any more mystical than than Nikola Tesla. So he's a yeah. contradiction. <laughs> You know and that reminds me of uh, that reminds me of one of my uh, one of my top quotes from Tesla that uh, um, I like to repeat, and it goes like this: He goes, "My brain is only a receptor. In the in the universe, there is a nucleus from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this nucleus, but I know it exists." Yes, yeah, he, he, he has this right passion to to continue with that to find solutions, and it's just it's brilliant. That's how I, where I that he where he reminds me of, uh, or Elon Musk reminds me of Tesla, is that he does. He's like, I know that this can be done better. I know that that this can be done, even though everybody's going to laugh at me. Yeah, two examples of that are Velcro, which came from the burrs that this guy discovered. The burrs when you walk through the forest now we use velcro for so many different things and the airplane we would never have invented the airplane if birds didn't fly there's no possible way and in the same sense with the ozone thing you want to study how to cure all diseases study the immune system and and, and what what you're talking about and what tesla's talking about mother nature is highly intelligent when i wrote the ozone book i began to realize that we are the product of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And we are fighting viruses all the time. I, I found yeah. one section, if you, uh, you could drink, a, a, I wouldn't recommend this, but you could drink a, a glass of ocean water. In that ocean water is hundreds of thousands of viruses. You will not die. Right. The reason why you won't die is because our body is so advanced. We know how to handle so many different viruses, so many different right. bacteria. Uh, but there's some that we still got to deal with, like the superbugs, you know, that are in the hospitals. And again, this goes on with, with, with do that. But it's a belief. And that's why he invented the induction motor, because he believed that Mother Nature had a better way for us to, to harness electricity than the inferior way that existed right then. So I think it's just really a, a matter. And maybe that is what another way to look at God, you know, that we are blessed. I, I'm sure you've thought about it. How the how, we even exist how come we even exist how come there's even anything and I, I remember one day i had a really bad flu and i i couldn't read a page of writing and i looked at my doctoral dissertation it was 700 pages long and i said to myself how the heck did he do that i can't even read a single page but that guy and then i realized it must be the flu the flu has so wiped me out uh you know but i became in awe of of this thing uh another you know you mentioned something else that inspired, uh, reminded me of something when i was like, young i as a joke in, in if you look at my high school yearbook you know what, what's your goal in life people put lawyer or doctor whatever i put pro basketball and it was a, it was a joke it was done as a joke because you know <laughs> I'm, I'm five foot six i'm not going to be a pro basketball player um but I had an idea when I got to college that although my height would stop growing, this thing would never stop growing. I could always learn Beautiful. more. And, and that, I think, is the message from Tesla, you know, that we can constantly learn more. So he's an inspiration. And I, and I think Elon Musk is an inspiration. I wish he would not be so nutty. And he's got a really nutty side because he, he is brilliant and he's done some incredibly great things. I think SpaceX is as good as it gets. I think the, the, the you know, building the, the battery companies now uh, for the for the car, we're gonna have electrical uh, lines on the highways. So you'll be getting electricity by wireless as the car, you know, drives along uh, um, and we're moving in that direction. They've got to figure something out, but I mean, Musk is also um, going in the direction of Toyota and Hyundai um, in the hydrogen aspect as well and uh there was just a big breakthrough i read about yesterday um and this is where musk is coming in because they're just like they can create better longer lasting and smaller hydrogen fuse cells 
in space. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing um, uh, that uh, I read is that um, cancer research is moving into space because cancer grows at 10 times the rate in space. So they can test medicines and get quicker results, whether the medicine is actually even gonna work or if they're wasting their time. Instead of waiting a year, they can have it done in a month. Um, so, you know- I always thought it was nutty that they wanted to go to Mars. I said, you gotta go to the moon. I mean, come on. I mean, the moon <laughs> is doable. Mars, forget it. I mean, so we gotta start at the moon. And, maybe and maybe we're not now to starting to rethink that and, and coming to that yeah. conclusion and to well, do probably to do these in in, in a, a lower yeah. uh, gravity situations yeah maybe we're not allowed to go to the moon anymore maybe it's off limits <laughs> Could it be. depends on what books books you read <clears throat> yeah all right Kilroy mark this has been exactly what i wanted it to be this has been phenomenal chatting with you again and about one mm -hmm. of our favorite uh inventors of all time uh an absolute visionary and uh you've got a movie that uh that you're working on obviously when it comes out you're going to give us a call let us know and uh, we will uh pump the hell out of it um if uh you want to chat about your theory at a, uh, on another date we're here for you so okay. we absolutely enjoy our conversations. Um, we did do the one interview on ozone, ozone therapy with you. Uh, social media doesn't like that very much. And uh, yeah. so we kind of got a little chastised on that one, but uh, it was worth it. And uh, it was phenomenal <laughs> information. So it was just a matter of going in and uh, doing a little bit of editing and uh, just to make everybody happy. So that's the world we're creating so far. But anyhow, it has absolutely been a joy. Any uh, uh, anywhere you want, any website or any uh, thing you want people to uh, to go to, we're going to put the links for your books in all the comments, and uh, so people can find out. Um, and uh, I'm also going to link uh, into for uh, for the series just uh, to give it a little bit of a pump too, because it's fascinating. Are there yes. any are there any movies? current movies like a movie movie on tesla that you would recommend has anyone done a biography of him i think that the the the, the uh the first one it's a, it's like a pbs one it has uh orson wells in it uh oh. but there's some good things to it um you'd have to look it up i i don't quite remember the title uh, there, was a, there was a there was a there was a movie uh, a few years ago called the prestige yeah, and uh, that stuff that was done by Christopher Nolan and uh, David Bowie played Tesla. Yeah, and that said, the reason it David Bowie perfect. played well, the reason he played Tesla is because he played him in the in the Man Who Fell to Earth as a, as an extraterrestrial. So yeah, Nolan, Nolan knew that. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember that movie. I, I think going. that's why we're making the film because we don't think that the films that have been made on Tesla really did him justice. And our motto has always been that the real story is more amazing than any work of fiction. So we're really trying <laughs> to stay hard uh, on trying to tell what really happened. Because you look at, I don't want to get to the world today, but could anyone imagine the world today? If if some if we read a book about today, no one would believe it. Um, so, yeah. so we live in a, a uh, so the truth is really more amazing than fiction. And that's really Tesla's really life. Good. All right. That's great. All right. Well, when all this stuff comes up, you got my number. Give me yeah. a shout and uh, we'll uh, get you on right away. And uh, that's all we got for today. Gary, any last questions? No, that was great. That was awesome. Was some really good stuff there. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, next. Great speaking with you guys. Pleasure. Yeah, you, great. you have a great one. And uh, be sure to send me that information on, a, on a, the Seattle clinics too. I will. I definitely will. Right. Thank you, sir. Have a okay. great one. Bye-bye. Be well.